Okay, so um, I'm going to start. I said I'd start at five past, but I think probably nobody's going to be missing anything if they miss this first bit. Um, so I'd just like to welcome everybody. Um, thanks for coming to the first EBNet webinar for the Bioinformatics Meetings Group. Um, I'm Sarah Forrester and I'm a co-chair for today's talks. We've also got Bing who introduced herself, who's also a co-chair for the sessions today. So the theme of today's webinar is using big data approaches to understand microbial communities. We've got two really good speakers today, who you'll be hearing from shortly. We've also got James Chong, who's the head of this working group, um, and he'll uh, talk to you about the working group for a couple of minutes um, after me. Um, we'd ask that you mute yourselves. I think you can't unmute yourselves um, with the settings that we've got anyway, but if you have a question, please just submit it directly into the Zoom chat. Um, we're going to have Sophie coming up first, and um, then she's going to have five minutes of questions after she's talked. And then we're going to have Uma presenting second, also followed by five minutes. Um, and then we have a short questionnaire that we're going to send out at the end of the session, which we'd like as many people to fill out as possible. So that because this is the first session in a series, we'd like to see what kind of things people are wanting to um, see, basically. Um, so I'm going to hand over to James now. He's going to introduce the working group and say a few words. Thanks very much, Sarah. Hello, everyone. Um, I actually was on the wrong link to start with, which doesn't bode very well if I'm supposed to be in charge. Anyway, I'm glad that I got here, even if I was nearly late from my own party. Um, I just want to welcome everyone again. Um, thank Sarah and Bing for organizing the working group and Angie and Louise at EBNet for all their support with this. And of course, our speakers as well, who we're going to hear about uh, from in a minute. So Sarah said, this is an EBNet working group for bioinformatics. We are set up to try and understand what sort of training this community would like. Um, so if you have an opinion or there are resources that you would like to share or resources you would like to see, uh, we would value your input. I have, after having told Sarah I wouldn't have any slides, I have two slides that I thought I should highlight. Um, and hopefully you can see this. So the first one is, um, in addition to the bioinformatics working group, at the moment we are running a project called CloudSpan, which is using cloud compute resources to try and um, give people, at the moment, basic training on how you would run bioinformatics workflows, like I guess the ones you're going to be hearing about today. Um, you can sign up for these, uh, access is free, um, the cloud compute resource is free for training at the moment um, and we'd be very happy to see people there. The other thing that dropped into my um, inbox yesterday is something I would like to flag to people if I can work out how to change slides. Um, and that's this uh, workshop that is going to be running at the Isaac Newton Institute for Mathematical Sciences in Cambridge later in the year, so from the 10th to the 14th of October. This is a workshop on microbial communities. Um, it's following uh, a much longer workshop that the Newton Institute ran in 2014. I was lucky enough to be at that one. It was absolutely fantastic. So if you have the opportunity to register for this, I would definitely encourage you to do that. Right, so without further ado, I'm going to try and stop sharing and uh, pass back to Sarah to introduce our first speaker. Okay, so we've got Sophie Nixon first, and she's a BBS, RC, David Phillips, and Dame Kathleen Olorenshaw Research Fellow at the University of Manchester. She's interested in diversity, function, and the adaptation of microbial life in deep terrestrial habitats, including those on Earth, and the potential for life on other planetary bodies. She uses high pressure observer simulation with genomics tools and geochemistry in order to understand the role of microbiology in these extreme environments. She's also interested in the attenuation of biofouling processes and the promotion of biotechnology to convert CO2 into useful products. And I'm sure she's going to give us a really great talk. So if you have any questions, um, just drop them in the chat and we'll discuss them after um, Sophie's finished. Thank you for that introduction. Thanks for the invite. Can everyone see my slides? Great, so I'm going to talk about a research project I've been working on for a long time. It's a side project, one that I've been um, using to sort of develop 
bioinformatics capability. So I thought it would be a nice way to illustrate um, some of the workflows I've been playing around with. I've, I've tried quite hard to use this data um, on free to access cloud compute facilities and off the shelf tools because, you know, a fledgling genomics person over here not really having access to mega group facilities. So along the way, I thought I'd highlight some of the some of the challenges and discuss a little bit more about the challenges at the end uh, about general bioinformatics approaches, uh, whilst hopefully um, telling you about some cool science. So this is a study about Greenland, deep green and borehole um, groundwaters. Let me just see if I can, there we go. So I, I got involved in this purely because um, uh, I, I had a, a colleague from Finland who had data and didn't have time to analyze it. It was a point when I was really becoming quite excited by the genomics approaches and wanted some data to play around with. So this is data that comes from uh, boreholes in Greenland. It's part of the, it's a spin out of the Greenland Analog Project. That project was um, launched to try and understand the connectivity between the surface and deep subsurface for potential location for nuclear waste disposal, which, I mean, it's hard to believe nuclear waste would be disposed of here, but it was a reason to drill these several boreholes, two of which had been studied in great detail. And this colleague of mine, Marlin Bomberg, um, she's a microbiologist in Finland, had the opportunity to take samples from two boreholes, extract DNA and RNA, do geochemistry and some culturing. And that DNA and RNA uh, metagenomic metatranscriptomic data is what I'm going to talk about here. So there's already a paper um, that she's published a few years ago, which is just 16 sRNA community profiles. Um, and you can, uh, this is the project, it's actually massive and it's, it's come to an end back, back in 2016. But this is sort of the spin out where there's less time pressure, thankfully. Um, so you can see here the locations. This is west of Greenland. This is the Fenno Scandian Shield, really ancient rock formation. And, and here, I hope you can see my cursor, but here is just the study area where these boreholes are located. Now I'm gonna use these uh, colored circles. Hopefully everyone can see this one's a green one and this is a yellow one. These are two independent drill holes in this area. One is 190 meters deep um, and green and analog project. That's what GAP means. O1 is drill hole one. And this is the other one, which is somewhat deeper. Um, and there are two samples from this site. So I've got access to the data from both of these. So just to contextualize where that is, um, why study the deeps of surface in the first place? Well, you kind of heard a little bit about the point of the green and analog project, subsurfaces where we might store waste, um, but it also harbors the unseen majority of life on earth. Uh, also the subsurface, especially the deep subsurface can be a very extreme environment. And that helps us understand the limits to life. Um, and also these boreholes already existed from this project and it's extremely challenging to get access to the subsurface, which is no coincidence why I tend to piggyback onto engineering aspects of the subsurface like shale gas, that's for another talk. So this project really allowed to make use of these, um, these existing boreholes for the microbiological studies. So this is just to summarize what we know so far. This is data that I've replotted here from the paper that's already been published. Um, this shows the 16S profile um, of the prokaryotic community from these boreholes. So we have, um, you can see a summary here, you've got the green borehole and the depth from which the water was taken was between 129 to 191 metres. And then two um, adjacent sample areas um, within this deeper borehole. So you've got this one without a dot, which is the less deep one, it's called mid um, and then the deeper one, which is called low, and I've just illustrated that with the dots. So from the rest of this talk, I'm probably just going to focus on the dots and the colours so that you don't get confused by the names. But as you can see, they vary in their sample depth. The volume from which this uh, nucleic acid was extracted is also very variable. That's a logistical issue that can't be changed. The temperature isn't super low. It's, it's generally below 10 degrees, which would be considered psychophilic if things were preferentially added adapted, but not really low, slightly alkaline, which is pretty typical for groundwaters, um, quite high salinity, especially in this deeper borehole, very little organic carbon, not very much carbon in general, very high sulfate. So that becomes quite relevant to the, to the story as we, as we evolve. My interest in the work was because we had such a, a huge dominance of this desulfosporocinus uh, bacteria, which I, in my PhD, actually found cold adapted iron reducing desulfosporocinus from below the Russell Glacier. So I was really keen to see whether we could recover genomes and understand how it was how it was coping in that environment. 
So the data that I'm dealing with, and I'm really only doing this bit, I have nothing to do with the sample prep and the sequencing side, but you can see here, these are um, two surface environments. So the, a lake nearby to the two drill holes and a drill pond that was used to the water from which was used to drill the boreholes. And these three uh, borehole samples, these collectively, uh, we had two metagenomic libraries sequenced per sample. So a total of 10. And then for these yellow borehole samples, the two ind independent samples, RNA was extracted and um, processed both for the whole RNA fraction and also our RNA removed. And this was sequenced for the metatranscriptomes. And then this really is my role, you know, doing this magic one bioinformatics thing that can just be quite overwhelming and can go on and on and on and on forever. But really who's there and what they can do, looking at functional potential, that's the metagenome, who's active and what are they doing? So looking at the metatranscriptome and what genes are being expressed, how that influences key biogeochemical processes. And also just a curiosity driven thing, what, what, what does the viral or the virome of this environment look like and how might that be shaping the community. So I thought I'd include this slide which gives a really broad picture of what tools I've been using. In the top right corner of all of my slides I've put some detail that tells you how I've, um, what, what point in this flowchart I've taken data from and what tool I've used. So I took the raw reads, quality check, read trimmed and then I've done annotations based on those reads. Um, to try and understand the, the, um, the taxonomy, but also viral, viral presence as well. And then um, the de novo assembly, you know, that's yielded annotations as well, which have allowed for uh, pathway analysis at the community level. Um, and then the key thing that I'm interested in is recovering genomes, which has been a real challenge with this data, and I'll go into why later. And then annotating those genomes to understand on a genome by genome level, who, who is there and what could they be doing? Um, and how active they might be. And just a snapshot of some of the tools I've been using. So firstly, to look at who's there, this is based on metagenomic reads, the trimmed reads. This is giving a picture of a very diverse, much more diverse than the 16S data suggested community. Now that could be that this is overly compensating for, you know, it's, it's producing more hits than there should be, or it could be that there's more access to those parts of the genome to allow for taxonomic classification, but it does look a lot more diverse. We can see in, in um, you know, so it's highly diverse across all samples. There's great, um, you know, replication between our two independent libraries. Uh, but as found in that initial paper, there is this broad difference between these surface-based samples and the below permafrost samples. So when we directly compare these results, um, to the published 16S data, as you can see here, I've just plotted it using the same color scheme so you can correlate what's there. Um, we see significantly more diversity compared to the 16S. And it appears from these metagenomic reads that desulfosporosinus is less dominant than in the published data sequence data. However, it's important to point out that the, the DNA used to process this sequencing were not the same extracts as those used for these. So it's perhaps not surprising we see some variability, but that maybe is a lesson in how variable these environments can be anyway. So then we look at who's active. We've got the same plot here, which is based on the metagenomic reads. And then when we compare these to the metatranscriptomic reads using the exact same tool, Kaiju, uh, using the same reference databases, we see quite a different picture, which is really interesting because we as environmental microbiologists re rely so much on looking at the DNA for who's there and who's important. So we can see that the active communities are also highly diverse and that some things that appear as very low taxa uh, low abundance taxa in the DNA profiling appear to be highly active. So examples here would be Pseudomonas, Bacillus, and also Legionella. So then moving on to functional potential at the community level. So these are the kind of um, processes that an environmental microbiologist interested in the deep biosphere might look for. So carbon fixation potential, how you can take inorganic carbon and fix that into organic molecules to fuel that process, the cells processes and also the community processes from then on. How you can fix nitrogen, which is a key limiting um, element in those systems, nitrate reduction, nitrite reduction, sulfate reduction. We, remember, we have very high levels of sulfate and also a related process, thiosulfate re uh, reduction and oxidation as well. So this is just the annotated assembled metagenomes passed through KEG-CATS. And you can see I've just given a tick or a cross whether those processes are encoded um, or they're absent. So we have 
potentially massive functional potential in these subsurface environments, less so particularly carbon fixation above the surface, which is perhaps not surprising, um, where there should be a much more readily available source of organic carbon, less need to, to, to fix carbon. I just wanted to compare it directly with this picture, which is the same annotations, uh, annotated as the same assembly, sorry, the metagenomic assemblies passed through a different tool called DRAM. Uh, this is from the Wrighton group, and it's actually intended to be used on, on genomes, and it's a really nice way of summarising uh, genome potential and uh, completeness and all those things, but it also allows you to pick out these things. And if I just flick back a slide and then to this, you can see already that we have some capacity loss just from running it through a different tool. So I'll come back to that later. And then going back to keg CAS, this is running the assembled metatranscriptome through KEG so that we can look at pathways expressed in the two deep boreholes for which we have RNA data. So we can see between the two different boreholes, we have key genes and pathways expressed, um, which indicates active carbon fixation, um, nitrogen fixation, nitrate and nitrite reduction, and also sulfur cycling as well. I'm just gonna flash up the difference between KEG and DRAM. So again, the same assembly run through a different tool. We still see a level of carbon fixation activity occurring, but we seem not to have any more this active nitrogen um, cycling and a more limited view of sulfur cycling. But nonetheless, I think it's a fairly robust picture of active sulfate and, and carbon fixation processes. Then looking at um, just using keg pathways, it's a really nice way to illustrate what's active, uh, what's encoded and what's expressed. So this is looking at the wood lung yaw pathway or also known as the uh, reductive acetyl CoA pathway. Um, this is a very commonly enriched pathway in subsurface communities. It's a very um, abundant pathway used to fix CO2, as you can see here. And uh, this is comparing, um, this is combining both of the deep borehole communities now. So we're looking at the deep borehole as a whole, rather than two discrete samples. And you can see every step in this pathway is encoded, and almost every step, bar one, um, we have evidence for gene expression for as well. And we see a really similar picture for sulfate reduction. Remember, we, we have high sulfate levels in this, in this particular borehole. So we have um, steps in the whole, the whole pathway for dissimilar results, sulfate reduction encoded and expressed, and many of the thiosulfate oxidizing genes as well also being expressed. Um, we see some level of expression based on the keg annotation of nitrite um, reduction and nitrogen fixation as well. So I wanted then in this talk to really um, zone in a bit more on carbon fixation. This is relevant to my um, current research areas, which are understanding the implications of storing CO2 in the deep subsurface. So I wanted to tease a bit more out into what carbon fixation pathways, there are six known pathways for fixing carbon, what level of gene enrichment we had and how much evidence for activity we have. So what you can see here, you don't need to worry about the detail, but the different colors broadly relate to the different um, cycles and pathways involved in carbon cycling. Here's one, the one that I mentioned before, the wood young girl, young doll. And then there's a combination of three that all overlap here. And then the Calvin cycle, which you will know predominantly as being the, the pathway used for photosynthesis. And you can see in all three samples, these are separated out again. So we've got the, the shallower borehole and the two deeper and the two samples from the deeper borehole. We see quite a good level of enrichment for, um, for this pathway here in particular, also plenty of genes here. Interestingly, in our deep, deep borehole, we have enrichment of genes involved in the Calvin cycle. So that's all very well looking at what's encoded, but let's look at what's expressed. So unsurprisingly, a much lower number, this is by the way, uh, normalized transcripts per million. So it normalizes for sequence, um, for coverage and um, sample size and things like that. So it's, it's to try and compare like for like. So when we use exactly the same metric, we see a much lower expression of genes, not surprisingly. We don't see any carbon fixation genes in this um, shallower deep borehole sample, but we do see some here. Now to zoom in on what these are, um, I've actually put in bold the genes that are in this plot here. So you can see which, which genes encoding these enzymes are being actively expressed. And also I should have mentioned this, that the um, asterisk means that they're encoded across all metagenomes. So you can see the asterisk gives you an indication of what's commonly enriched. And anything in gray just doesn't appear on this plot at all, and certainly not this one. 
So um, this one's really interesting, this dark green one, because it's actually the Rubisco um, gene, which uh, recent, relatively recent research has indicated is actually very commonly used as carbon fixation pathway in the deep subsurface, despite it being associated with photosynthesis. So we have some nice evidence of what those active um, carbon processes are. I should have mentioned this is a Proca annotated um, view of what's going on, so a different tool again. And then just to look at net carbon fixation versus CO2 production, this again is something I'm interested in in terms of CO2 storage. I looked at all the gene uh, the enzymes that are responsible for fixing CO2, regardless of CO2 uh, carbon fixation pathway, and those that are responsible for producing CO2. And then you can look more on a relative um, comparison here rather than absolute numbers. So there still are calculated for TPM abundance, but here it's really just looking at what proportion of this is there compared to this. So we have both in the encoded and expressed groups. So this is obviously metagenome, this is metatranscriptome, a slight dominance of CO2 fixing enzymes over CO2 producing enzymes, which does appear to suggest CO2 on the whole at community level is being pulled out of that system, which is really interesting from a CO2 storage point of view. So looking a bit closely now into who's there and what they're doing. So this is a, a matrix of metagenome assembled genomes or MAGs. I cannot express the amount of time it's taken me to produce this, um, mainly because I've used a manual binning method and I'll go into that in a bit more detail in a second. But I've just pulled out some of the genomes that I would consider high quality. These ones in bold here are considered draft quality based on their completion contamination. And then here, this is just really just a quick check through KEGCAS who can do what. So we've got the Woodlong Yard um, pathway again and all these things that you've already seen. This here, FE3 reduction, I think is based on FE3, FE gene. It's a, it's a tool used to flag um, iron cycling capabilities. And here I've put taxonomy based on um, GT, this GTDB toolkit, or when I've needed to, just relying on the check M. So a real mixture of tools summarized hopefully in a way that makes sense. And you can see from these names, we have quite a uh, diverse array of things going on here. Um, I just wanted to draw upon one example here to illustrate how the manual binning is done, because this is something you're probably not familiar with. I did actually bin these with lots of different tools, including Max Bin, Concoct, and Metabat, but in every instance I got significantly more contaminated and less complete genome bins, and I just wasn't quite happy with that. Um, however, I would say, all of these organisms are very close in their GC ratio and they exist in the system in a very similar abundance, so it's become really difficult to tease them apart. Anyway, this is a pipeline that I've adapted from the writing group, that's who I worked and trained with a few years ago, and this spits out basically a, um, a file that you can open in, in Excel, it tells you the GC content, the coverage, which we sort of use as a proxy for abundance, a rough idea of what the gene is based on a UniREF 90 annotation, the identity of that gene to so this taxon here, and an e-value. So you can use that primarily to bin based on taxonomy. So if we just focus on this green, this, this brown bit here, this is how I bin the Lysobacter, or as I called it, the Lysobacter genome. Or rather, is that, that, I think I, I settled on the, 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 the level above. So you can pull those contigs out and, and plot them and it shows you coverage versus GC and it will tell you where the clusters are and you simply just remove anything that looks like it's not belonging to that genome. And this seems to result in, in very, very good genomes, so it's laborious. Anyway, to place those into context, you can see that some of the things that are very high abundance are actually very difficult to bin, wh whichever way you use, just because there are so many genomes with the same tax on there. So this is just to show how broadly spread they are. And this, I would say, is a reason why it's important to do your community analysis as well as your MAG-based analysis, unless you have a really low diversity community. Um, and just to look at, just to focus on the d sulfosporosinus that I was particularly interested in at the beginning, um, just doing a blast P of the transcriptomics, uh, the, the, the annotated um, and assembled metatranscriptome to uh, this particular bin. This, by the way, is coverage. I use that number in my bin names to indicate how abundant they were, and this is GC. So this is a particularly abundant mag from one of the borehole environments. We have lots and lots of hits here, but I've just pulled out some of these. So there are some that look like they're involved in carbon fixation, but also in sporulation, osmoprotection, chemotaxis, so and alkaline shock proteins. So it's not just a picture of, of energy production, it's also of um, uh, survival and adaptation in this environment. 
And then based on just passing it through the same, the same pipeline used bin manually, you can pass netatranscriptomic assemblies through that, and it will give you a taxonomic assignment as well as an indication of genes. So we can see a similar thing. We've got flagella that probably linked to chemotaxis. We can see evidence of um, um, metabolism here and stress proteins as well. So a really mixed, mixed view. I'm really going to just go over this very quickly, but I wanted to pull out the viral abundances. This is also using Kaiju. If you use it with certain uh, reference databases, it will tell you the proportion of virus abundance. Um, you can work this out, how many contigs there are. I think I used um, Veasorter for this and normalized it per million reads. And you can also look at CRISPRs per community. So this really gives you a vision of the viral load in these different environments and how resilient the community there might be to them. So I was wondering whether there was a big difference between the above surface and below surface. And certainly the CRISPR um, arrays seem to be much more abundant in the surface. So viral predation seems to be somewhat attenuated based on this view. Um, and then you can look bin by bin. So this, you can see um, these were the placeholder genomes before I finished the manual binning. This is to look at prophage in those genomes. So you can see actually in those genomes directly, if you have any integrated phage genomes, you can see whether there are CRISPR loci in those genomes and how many spaces there are. The number of spaces is an indication of how predated upon that organism has been. So the higher the number, the, 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 the more predation has occurred on that particular organism. So that's quite an interesting view. I haven't really decided if this shows anything useful, but it's to illustrate, if nothing else, that you can look at viruses as well. So just to wrap up the key findings, this is more the science view here. Uh, we have highly diverse communities in all samples. There's a distinct composition below and, and above the surface, which we saw from previous research, but this gives us a more complete view. We see very diverse active communities with low abundance tax are appearing to play potentially a very high, highly active role. For example, the Bacillus, the Legionella, we also saw Pseudomonas active. There is, there's um, the subsurface communities in code for carbon, nitrogen, and sulfur cycling pathways, which could be important in those situations. And the metatranscriptomic data demonstrates that these pathways are active in deep pore holes, or at least depending on which tool you decide to use your data from. Um, certainly the carbon and sulfur, I think, is a fairly robust um, result. And several high quality mags were recovered, which have the capacity for nitrogen fixation, nitrate and nitrite reduction. We have some encoding for carbon fixation and sulfate reduction as well. So it gives you an idea of how those roles are, are shared between the community members. Um, and we found that our most, one of our most dominant taxon, desulfur sporocyanus, was expressing genes for flagella, chemotaxis, sporulation, carbon fixation, and, and sulfur cycling as well. We see a similar low abundance of viruses across all samples, but lower viral immunity in subsurface communities compared to the surface. We find <clears throat> when we look on the mags by mags basis, we have prophage in some of these mags and evidence of viral immunities, particularly with a high number of spaces in some. And then just to add this net carbon fixation implication. So we, we, we see from this community in particular, the deep borehole seems to be fixing more CO2 than it produces. Now I want to shift tack a little bit to talk very briefly about some of the challenges around this. I mean, I can't really go into details about how much work that was because as background, I was using this data as a bit of a test bed while I was becoming independent. So I've done much more work on it than I would need to if all I was trying to get out of it was a paper. But I find myself in a position now where I'm establishing a group of my own which heavily relies on bioinformatics like I've shown you here. And there's a huge bottleneck to this and that's access to computational resources and indeed cost. So some of you might have seen this already. I did a quick poll on Twitter yesterday to try and understand who uses what. I'm wrestling with our own organization HPC cluster at the moment and it's really difficult to make inroads there but it still seems that most people rely on these. Cloud-based VMs of which um, you know CloudSpan is a really good example, I'd not heard of that one before so thanks for flagging that James. These can be really flexible and particularly useful for all the downstream processes like the binning and things like that. Um, but this is what some people actually tweeted me directly about so you've been using HPC systems or clouds Another group have got its own server that they built up from scratch. You know, this is, this is a big job. And then another group, which I thought was quite staggering, actually, the amount of compute resource this one group has. And I followed up with this person and asked about 
cost I just flag that there it this is the thick end of a million pounds to build this system for one group so it's expensive and it takes a huge amount of maintenance as well and so I would encourage people to look into as many free to access cloud based VMs as possible. I actually did almost all of this work on CLIMB um, and I'm working with CLIMB to try and design some metagenomic specific um, VMs, which would, you know, would be something that potentially could be useful for cloud span as well. Um, and also I was part of my fellowship, I'll be running a, a, training, a training workshop for that. So I'd be very interested in hearing from you all uh, what you want that to look like and if there are particular challenges you want covered. And perhaps it's something to coordinate with, with James as well. And a shameless plug at the end here, if you know of anyone, um, or if you indeed yourselves want to, then I, I've got a PhD opportunity at the moment. Um, so shameless plug, I'm going to um, leave that there for a second and um, no, I'll, I'll, I'll go back to this and I'll stop sharing my screen now. So thank you very much for that and um, appreciate your attention. Thanks very much, Sophie. That was a really interesting talk. Um, if anybody has some questions, if they can put them into the chat, that'd be really useful. Um, um, so somebody said, uh, how do you approach choosing a consensus result for a bioinformatic analysis? For example, a metagenome assembly or binning when different tools are all giving you different results? That's a really, really good question. I can answer them confidently about binning and assemblies because I spent quite a long time. So I used different binning approaches and different assembly approaches, but the assembly is quite critical because it comes before everything downstream. So I, the, the results that I've shown today for the metagenomes, I used IDBA UD, but I also tried Metaspade um, and a number of others, MegaHit, which is a much more computationally efficient version if you don't have access to high compute. Uh, and then there's a really nice tool called CAST, QUAST, Q-U-A-S-T, or MetaQuast, and you can compare all the metrics from those in alongside one another. So I chose the ones that I did based on getting the best number of long consigs with the best M50 and all those other metrics. So it, it, it's difficult because one size does not fit all with these things. So at every stage of this data, I've been trying as many tools as possible and figuring out what I like. The same happened for the binning. I binned with MetaBat, Max bin, concoct, and I manually binned, and I stuck with the manual binning despite the huge number of hours it's taken me because it consistently gave the best results on completion contamination. The thing that I'm a bit stuck on, which I just don't really know how you, it's a difficult one because it's, you have to really think about how you make that call, is the annotation. Now, what I didn't talk about is that there are actually annotation servers that you can upload your data to, like IMG. Um, the problem I have with those is that it starts a clock then before that data becomes publicly available. Um, so you've got to be quite careful about that. As soon as that data is publicly available, there will be groups around the world who might just be fishing for metagenomic data sets and could use it before you. And, and I feel strongly that I want to get as much as I can out of a data set before that first paper comes out. So I've been trying, quite coveted about my data and I'm in the process of building my own annotation pipeline because of all the pitfalls of using these different annotation pipelines, but I think it, it involves reading into the particular tool, working out what comparisons they've done, what the individual metrics they use to decide a gene is a gene, how big the database they're drawing on is, if you can do anything to fine tune it to better suit your data set. It's a really difficult one. Um, and I think a discussion within a community like this is a good way to start thinking about what tools suit better things and how we could try and work together to, to produce better tools. This is a critical question there, so hopefully it's, uh, yeah, answered that. I think it does, it really depends on your data set, because we also like have a lot of metagenomes and we tried like concoct and thought that did a really bad job with some of our data and we've got um, a method that we use now that works the best for us, but it really does depend on the data and if it's, so we use a lot of nanopore data as well as Illumina data and that makes it a bit easier for the binning because the genomes are a bit more complete. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and that's the other thing. It's all the other things before you get to the, the fast cube files that can help you. So I, we're moving towards polishing with Illumina and using long reads as our scaffolds for genomes so that you can remove some of that ambiguity, um, which if you're looking at genome by genome view is a really good way to go. The, the thing that I found particularly frustrating about this data set is that all of the taxa that appear to be important have similar abundances. The coverage is similar, which is how 
how most binning programs dis differentiate between different organisms. Their GC content overlapped a lot. So that's why the binning works best manually, because you've got that ability of using your brain to identify patterns in taxonomy, which, is, which an algorithm doesn't do. But there is just a limit to how much you can achieve binning a, a community where there's so much similarity on a genetic basis. So definitely the more low diversity communities you can get, the easier you're making it for yourself with binning. Um, and if you can use long read sequencing to help, then that would definitely be a good call. So um, Eleanor Green has asked um, if you could tell any more about the, I think it was the biome annotation software Ka Kaiju, and if you've got any idea of how, um, how it compares to Kraken 2. So Kraken 2 is annotation software. Yeah, um, I haven't used Kraken, but I think I didn't use it because either the databases that you can use for it overlapped already with Kaiju or they just didn't seem as good. I have tried doing the same data analysis with Metaflam 3. I've also redone the Kaiju analysis recently because I've been so suspicious about the high diversity that's been kicked out from those results. I've redone it with slightly more stringent um, settings and it looks the same. Um, so I think really that comes down to what's in the database that's being compared, your data is being compared to, how relevant that is to your system. I think I chose RefSeq with curated genomes because I cared about getting identification that meant something, but it was it was a big database. So you can you can use Kaiju really easily actually on a web server. You just up, upload your files and you can upload several in one go, your fast Q files, and then it produces lovely um, plots like bubble plots and also um, interactive um, pie charts as well, chrono charts. So I'd highly recommend using it, even if you end up not using that for your final taxonomic assignment. It's a great way to get a sense of what's there. So actually, when I tried Metaflam 3, I didn't get a huge amount of consensus in my majority taxa, which was weird. So as soon as I used Kaiju, I saw loads of desulfosporosinus and loads of other things that I'd seen in the 16S data. So that just felt right. And I've done the same with completely different sets of data. And Still, the data is a bit messy. The results a bit messy from Kaiju. It's always so high abundance, diversity, diversity rather. But it 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 seems to be the least bad one that I've tried. So, um, Uma made a good comment saying that there's a few strategies um, available that can consolidate multiple binning approaches and can rebin bin them and reassemble those bins. I think using MetaRap end? Yeah, yeah. so I'm, I'm, I'm in the process of fighting with my research IT team to get MetaRap successfully installed and compiled. So MetaRap is a really useful way of compiling three different binning tools, and then it can find the best consensus, exactly what you said. Yeah, and then it integrates CheckM and GTDB, TK, which are all really nice tools for assigning taxonomy and understanding quality. My bottleneck here, honestly, it's the most frustrating thing. It's either downloading and uploading data from a cloud VM where I've been able to do the analysis back to my HPC cluster or just getting the tools in installed on the HPC cluster in the first place. So I did want to highlight that in this talk because I do think that's, you know, you can have access to some of these really brilliant tools, but if you don't have a system to run it on or support to install those systems, then it's, it's redundant. Um, I think yeah. that's a problem that we're quite lucky at York because we have a really amazing cluster, but there's lots of universities that don't have access. So things like cloud computing is really important, I think, mm. to kind of fill that gap. Um, there's, uh, sorry, there's a couple more. Just to add to that, a, a cost, cost issue. I've been quoted 14,500 to add a high memory node to the server, which doesn't get me exclusive access. But for that money, I'm pretty confident I could buy a box that could live under my desk and do everything I need. So the incentive is just really not always there to make this integrated, but that's what we lack. You know, there's a community across our university who wants to be doing more of this, but they don't have centralised compute facilities that work. So it's a huge bottleneck. Yeah, sorry, carry on. <laughs> it's okay. So um, uh, we've had a question. Um, did you look at genes involved in just secondary metabolism or did you mainly focus on primary metabolism? So I, I work in the MIB, the Institute of Biotechnology. We have lots of groups here that are interested in metagenomics as a, as a source of discovery of novel pathways. So they've got some really nice tools. One is called AntiSmash, which can identify gene clusters and pathways. So I have run them through that and there's been some interesting things. The problem, I suppose, with this sample is that I don't have this set of data is that I don't have access to the original samples. There's not a huge amount we can do with some of those results, but it's definitely something I'm looking more at. 
with, um, so I mainly work with experimental systems where I can engineer the diversity to be lower. Um, and that's something we will be looking at, secondary metabolites. And the reason that I'm here is to try and integrate that into other studies as well, looking at potential for novel pathways for folks, yeah. Um, and I'm just gonna have one last question for you. So somebody asked about whether you thought it was worth looking at the metaproteome when trying to look at the functionality of the community. Yep, absolutely. I mean, um, in fact, the PhD opportunity I flagged at the end is, is to, combine, to combine all the kind of meta-omics tools that you could think of, but really you probably don't need to do that a lot of the time. If you, if you can time resolve and you can go from the code that ultimately decides whether you can make that protein or not, and you can identify proteins and map them back, yeah, that, that can be a really effective way. I quite like the metagenomic, metatranscriptomic process because you can do a lot of the same um, analysis with both sets of data, whereas proteomics is tends to be a different kind of approach to analyzing your data, but it's a very powerful one. So proteomics, not only that, but metabolomics, you can see ultimately what's produced from those proteins so that you've got that whole understanding of, of function rather than just uh, capacity. Yeah, definitely. And I think that's the way we'll move forward with this, is coupling these things to get a more complete picture. Thanks very much for your answers. And we're gonna move on to the next speaker now. Um, all right. Um, okay, so our next speaker will be uh, Dr. Umar Yijais, if I'm <laughs> pronouncing correctly. Um, so uh, this is uh, Bing Guo from University of Surrey, and I'm very glad to introduce um, Umar uh, today to talk about um, uh, the uh, microbial communities through in-situ omics data synthesis. And Dr. Umar Yijais is uh, leading several projects um, using the micro, uh, using the uh, omics data analysis um, in the areas of water and wastewater treatment, aquaculture, agriculture, and health and uh, uh, the plant disease. So it really covers a huge uh, variety of uh, applications. And uh, the floor is yours, um, Dr. Ijay. Thank you. Um, you can all hear me, right? Yes. And you can all see my slides, right? Yes. Okay, great. So um, first of all, um, I would like to acknowledge several groups that I'm part of uh, the work that I'm quoting here. Uh, basically uh, comes from my association with all these groups. Uh, uh, primarily, I'm based in water environment group. Um, where we are looking at water and wastewater system, uh, but there, there's some work that is being done on uh, IBDs, uh, which is under this bingo group uh, in Glasgow. Then I am also involved in using ancient DNA um, as a proxy for climate change. And this, this work is being done with, uh, with a group in Norway. And recently I've been involved in bacterial plant diseases, uh, uh, primarily Pectobacterium atroseptikum uh, to look at uh, black leg. So uh, the first uh, step was just to acknowledge them. And I'm actually a reader in information engineering at Glasgow. And disclaimer, I'm not a microbiologist. I am a computer engineer and I work uh, as exclusively on uh, uh, algorithm development. And here is the definition from Wikipedia. What does an information engineer typically does? Um, he works on generation, distribution analysis, and use of information in systems. And I rely heavily on machine learning, data mining, and other computational techniques. And bioinformatics is one such example. Over my uh, career uh, span, I have worked on different types of data, whether it is one dimensional data, for example, Raman spectra that we can get for microbes. Um, I've also worked on two dimensional, three dimensional volumes, for example, ultrasound images. And recently I've worked on um, N dimensional tables, those that originate from metaomics. And then the other work that I do is on network inference and shrink processing example, DNA sequence. So I did not have a very good start to my career. I focused on different engineering applications. Uh, I did my PhD from South Korea and then I moved to Cambridge and then I moved to Oxford. And uh, during that time period, I worked on different uh, systems. Uh, for example, this is the work that I did in my PhD where we I tried to uh, came up with dynamic algorithms to 
find the boundaries of air bubble that travel through this opaque pipe. Then I had a change of heart and I uh, worked on 3D imaging modalities and we can see these cute uh, babies um, uh, that are 3D rendered. And I also then shifted to Oxford to work in the physics department there to find associations between time signals. Um, these are mainly static and dynamic associations, uh, whether they are directed or whether they are not undirected, whether they're not directed. And so these were the applications that I worked on uh, between 2004 to 2012. And then I had a change of heart and I thought that maybe I could lead on microbial ecology. And this was mainly possible because I acquired a Nurcomics fellowship. And through that Nurcomic fellowship, I then uh, worked on different uh, omics modalities, um, mainly amplicons, whether it is uh, 16S, 18S, RNA, or other amplicons. I also worked on whole genome shotgun metagenomics, and I am also interested in integrating uh, host profile uh, with uh, microbial community data. Um, and I've worked on metaproteomics, transcriptomics, and in, because I'm an engineer, I'm also interested in hardware devices uh, uh, that can harness the power of microbes. And if you have multiple omics modalities there, then we are really interested in integrating them. And so a large uh, uh, part of my research is involved in integrating all these omics modalities. So um, uh, Sophie mentioned about the problems associated with uh, having a cluster or accessing a cloud computing. So we are lucky in a sense that uh, in order to enable me to do all this kind of uh, fascinating research, I have built my own cluster. And this cluster is called Orion cluster. And uh, so far in the past uh, eight years, I have built it to a capacity where we are able to do everything in-house, whether it is metagenomic binning or whether it is using it for other high uh, 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 memory intensive and computational tasks. And I routinely work on this uh, cluster and uh, in, with, with, in water environment group, we have other modalities from which we acquire additional data, whether it is flow cytometry or whether it is metabolomics. And using this cluster, we just get these easy to use abundance tables. And then we simply uh, use multivariate statistical analysis on it. So in the first instance, I'm going to develop, uh, I'm going to discuss recent developments, um, the omics approaches, whether it is amplicons, metagenomes or metabolomics. And then I will discuss the activities that, uh, that, that, that I have been part of, whether it is benchmarking studies or whether it is workflow development or the text mining strategies. And follow, following this, I will discuss the uh, multivariate statistical analysis that we have been doing, particularly in terms of uh, statistical packages that we have developed. Um, so um, in, the, in, the, in the start of my uh, research career on microbial uh, ecology, I focused a lot on benchmarking different platforms and different library preparation techniques, both for microbiome and mycobiome. And one of the uh, the one of the papers that have uh, is, is gaining a lot of citation is this paper where we have uh, discussed the software strategies to decrease error rates in. Uh, Illumina MySeq platform. So this figure that you see on the left side, the uh, y-axis is the error rates of raw reads and the uh, x-axis is uh, error rates of reads after correction. And we would like to remain uh, as left as possible. So this, the choice of uh, the pre-processing steps uh, that we uh, have uh, typically, uh, that we typically involve uh, th th those choices were uh, instrumental in reducing the uh, substitution error rates in, in, in uh, data sets that originate from um, MySeq. And that is uh, something that we have done. So the, the, we, in, in, in my lab, we, we routinely perform these uh, benchmarking studies and these are all the papers uh, that uh, you may find relevant. Then the other thing that we have done is we have uh, basically used uh, Nanopore and we came up with a 
workflow, both library preparation and the associated bioinformatics workflow uh, to improve uh, uh, the uh, or decrease the error rates that are associated with uh, um, Oxford Nanopore. So Oxford Nanopore is, is, is used a lot in uh, genomic assembly and there are tools like Nanopolish um, that enable uh, removal of uh, noise if you have enough redundancy there. But uh, using Nanopore to uh, do uh, community surveys is still uh, a bit challenging. And the reason is that in order to discriminate between different species, uh, you do that based on uh, their sequence similarity and with the error rates that are very high uh, in uh, Oxford Nanopore, uh, utility of it in, in uh, using short amplicons is still, uh, uh, we are still quite far off. So what we proposed was to change the library uh, preparation protocol uh, where we are using uh, rolling circle amplification. So you have um, uh, enough redundancy there. If you, if, if you are familiar with the uh, Oxford Nanopore, um, we have a template strand and we have a complement strand. Um, we just simply have a, we just connect them together. This goes through the Oxford nanopore. So the, the, it goes through these nanopore. Um, so the changes that we have done is that we have actually created multiple redundancies there. So if we can copy this over and over again, and you have a very long uh, uh, sequence or DNA fragment, then if we can fold this on top of each other, there is a high possibility that if we take a consensus sequence of all of this, we should be able to remove errors. And this was, uh, this is precisely what we did, a change in the amplification protocol. And we uh, had a new informatics tool that through which we were able to uh, get uh, around 99.5% accuracy for 1.6 KB amplicons. So we tested it on mock communities. So you give them, you, 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 you put 10 uh, uh, species together and we are getting roughly around 11 um, uh, OTUs back. And these are the uh, accuracy for all of these uh, different uh, OTUs. So yes, uh, we were able to use uh, nano, uh, we, we were able to use uh, Oxford Nanopore successfully to distinguish between a microbial community members. Um, then you guys have talked about CONCOC. So I have had the honor of being part of uh, the team that led to development of CONCOC, um, which is uh, useful for binning metagenomic contexts based on both Kamer composition and uh, the coverages. So the recent development that has taken place is that we have taken CONCOC forward and one of my PhD student has developed uh, an easy to use interface that can integrate with CONCOC where you can perform all kinds of statistical analysis, whether you would like to explore diversity estimates, whether you would like to find the differential abundance or whether you would like to add another modality, mainly uh, metabolomics, or you would like to get all the functional pathways out. So this is the uh, recent uh, update to uh, the work that we have done on uh, CONCOC. And the other thing that I have been involved in is that we, because everyone is working on uh, data sets uh, where uh, they are uh, recording all the metadata information. Uh, for example, if you submit a genome to NCBI, you also uh, incorporate where that genome is isolated from, and you also have an associated uh, publication. So we developed a few text mining engines where whatever you uh, uh, obtain, you can search it against this public repository and you can then run these text mining engine on the text that is associated with it. So the C can be pipeline. Uh, if you give your Amplicon data, it goes online. If you give it a fecal sample, 
uh, without knowing where the sample is coming from, it tells you that it is a feces sample. Uh, if you give it a water sample, it tells you that it is a water sample. And the reason is mainly because of the sequences that were previously isolated, they were isolated from feces or they were isolated from water. So we have then extended this uh, pipeline um, and this has now become a Texas-centric approach, uh, which involves uh, entropy-based approaches. And more importantly, we have uh, basically generalize these uh, pipelines to write uh, automatic systematic reviews um, and we are using different types of ontologies uh, that you can uh, use on any kind of literature survey so essentially um, as academic we are asked for writing a systematic reviews. so this pipeline does everything and you just sit and relax and it will uh, help you in proving or disproving a hypothesis. Um, the other thing that I have been working on is on developing uh, a software infrastructure to enable uh, microbial community analysis within an environmental context. So Microbiome Seek is uh, an R package that comes from my lab and towards the other end, uh, we are also working on, on speeding up uh, the traditional analysis uh, by using parallel processing and we have this uh, software called RV Lab that can even run on uh, your mobile phones. Um, it, uh, we have a server that is running in Greece and this is the work that we have done with our international partners. <clears throat> the other thing <clears throat> that I have been working on is on on uh, seeing whether we can get uh, something like uh, an assessment of RNA from environmental samples. So we came up with a differential amplicon based approach. So we take a sample and we use two different amplicons, a shorter amplicon and a longer amplicon with the underlying premise being that the longer amplicon has, uh, will get uh, digested more quickly. So if we take a ratio of this, we can basically predict um, how intact the RNA is. Um, so regular uh, assessment on bio, using bioanalyzer typically relies on RIN, which is not very uh, effective when you have uh, degradation under ultraviolet. Uh, whereas uh, our approach called our RAMP approach is able to tell you precisely that RNA has degraded, um, um, particularly in the case of UV. So this was the new approach that we, we, we introduced. And then I'll, I'm going to talk about engineering applications and products. So because I'm an engineer uh, and I work in an engineering department, so we are trying to exploit and harness microbial communities in both natural and engineered systems. Um, and our interest is in emulating natural processes, processes through bioreactors. For example, one of the work that I'm involved in is in creating <clears throat> artificial and, and intestine. And um, we also want to improve drinking water and wastewater treatment system with better filter design and harvesting additional heat from households. So this is uh, basically as a result of this EPSRC program grant running uh, called Decentralized Water Technologies where we, we want to take uh, wastewater treatment to household rather than having a, very, having a central uh, facility. And as a result of working on these uh, products and engineering systems, we are also able to come up with dietary interventions that can modulate gut microbiome. And other than that, uh, because metagenomics of uh, whole community is a very complicated process, whether it is in terms of binning or it is in terms of uh, other things. So we have, uh, sorry. So we have uh, uh, also tried to uh, incorporate microfluidics uh, to make it an easier problem. So then uh, this is where I'm talking about uh, the uh, engineered systems that we have published. For example, we recently published uh, last year uh, a salmon 
uh, intestine uh, system, which is through these different bioreactors. So we have three different uh, areas of uh, intestine, uh, stomach, pyloric, cecum, and midgut that we have used. Um, and we can inoculate it with the actual microbiome that exists in uh, salmon and we can test uh, aqua products. Uh, that is something that we have done. On the other side, hand, in case of wastewater treatment plants, we have uh, supplemented our wastewater, uh, these uh, septic tanks with the solar panels to, uh, to, to direct energy in, in, in these septic tanks. And that should be able to optimize the anaerobic digestion processes. So that is another engineering innovation we have done. And then uh, I work exclu with uh, exclusively on trying to um, sort uh, microbes uh, using um, Raman activated cell sorting system. So we developed a classifier where if we can give stable isotope like 13C, we should be able to sort microbial cells by shining laser on them. If you shine laser on them and if there is a shift in Raman signal, then we are able to collect the cells that, are, that have a particular role to play. And as a result of that, uh, we can have... Uh, we can, we can have a very simple uh, problem uh, where we can subsequently do metagenomics on only those, uh, those microbes that have a, a particular function to play. And other than that, we have our own diet that we developed, uh, uh, which we call CD treat. And that uh, is used as an alternative to improve uh, health of pediatric patients, um, to reduce their gut inflammation. And lastly, um, we are able to uh, do uh, low temperature anaerobic treatment of municipal wastewater effectively by having a better bioreactor design. Um, so these are EGSB uh, full-scale reactors that we have been developing with NUI Galway. So that was about the software and uh, engineering systems that we developed. Now I'll speak a little bit about the approaches that we are currently developing. So I'm very much interested in integrated omics approach where you have uh, either the data in a categorical, uh, in a case control relationship, or you have a data on a longitudinal scale, or you have a data on a spatial scale, and where you have, uh, uh, different modalities. Uh, you have samples, you have features there. So maybe you have 16S there and maybe you have metagenomics there. So my interest is on integrating other modalities on the same feature space. Uh, so you can supplement it with metabolome, you can supplement it with flow cytometry. And then this, because the sample space is common, then this kind of a problem is called an integration problem or you have a nested multifactorial design where you have repeatability there. Um, so the modality doesn't change, but because there's a repeatability there, then this becomes P integration problem. So I've been using different algorithms. Uh, they are uh, uh, collectively, they're called sparse projection to latent structure discriminant analysis and their uh, multi data set uh, uh, derivatives. Uh, so this is uh, this mint algorithm is useful when you have repeatability in your data set, and this Diablo algorithm is useful when you have multiple modalities there. The advantage of uh, these algorithm is that they work in a, in similar to how PCA works. Um, but they are guided where you already know what is the uh, labeling or what is the uh, uh, conditions under which you have generated the data. And the other advantage is that the optimization function for these algorithms involve what is called uh, an L1 penalty uh, constraint where when you run these algorithms, you can get discriminating features um, that correlate between these multiple data set and you can control a trade-off, but you can actually 
have a trade off between the amount of discrimination you require and the amount of correlation that you want. And so one of the first papers where we have used this is to integrate um, um, 2D GC by GCMS, which offers better resolution in terms of the metabolites with uh, the associated uh, 16S communities. So you can do uh, uh, reduce ordination simultaneously and you are we are able to find uh, the metabolites that uh, correlate with uh, our 16S DNA features and through this we can fill in the gaps and we can understand uh, these communities better. I've also used it in this the same approach, uh, the Diablo approach by integrating multi-omics data set. So we have 16S profile using bacteria, we have 18S uh, profile uh, for fungi, and then we have a volatile organic uh, carbon, uh, uh, which we have done using gas chromatography. And so we are able to tell how much of these data set correlate overall uh, a bit, uh, and we can also find discriminant features across all these three data sets. So this is something that we have done. And then one of the important projects that I would like to highlight is this uh, ancient DNA that we, can, we are using as a proxy for reconstructing past sea ice evolution. So traditionally, so th th this data set is basically, this goes uh, 100,000 years and traditionally they were using um, organic geochemistry uh, markers such as IP25. Um, the abundance of it uh, correlates with the uh, sea ice cover. So what we have done is uh, we have used Diablo algorithm to correlate uh, these traditional geochemistry parameters with the uh, 18S uh, uh, profile. And we were able to find uh, species uh, uh, that correlate directly with the geochemic uh, uh, chemistry parameters. And then we can simply use the uh, abundance of these species um, as a proxy for uh, sea ice evolution. So again, that was made possible by using um, that Diablo algorithm. So the other thing that people are very much interested in is uh, the stability analysis in microbial communities. And, uh, and this is particularly important in view of wastewater treatment system where these systems fail. So you need to come up with a way through which you can in advance suggest uh, whether the system will fail or not. And there are several proxies uh, which can judge stability in both abundance and function. Um, one, uh, something that I like uh, a lot is local contribution to beta diversity, which is a measure of dysbiosis. And we have used this in longitudinal study, wherever the value sh shoots up. For example, uh, this is pharyngeal microbiome uh, for uh, day two, five, day seven, day eight, day nine. So wherever uh, people are using antibiotics, uh, this LCBD value goes high and this can be used as a measure of dysbiosis. In another, uh, for another individual, wherever the person develops cold, the community uh, differs. And so it is a one dimensional measure that you can use uh, to get uh, how much dysbiosis is, is there. And the other advantage is that you can use, because it's a one-dimensional measure, you can use it in regression models and you can then uh, make it depend on other sources of variation. And another thing that, uh, so, so that was like taxonomic stability, but recently a paper came out in 2018 where we can also give uh, functional robustness um, in terms of two parameters. One is called attenuation and the other one is called buffering. So what we essentially do is we take a sample and we have the uh, relative proportion of all these uh, community members. So what we do is we create artificial perturbation and we can, and for each artificial uh, perturbation, which is near nearer to uh, what is the original perturbation, uh, we are able to measure both the taxonomic shift of these perturbations, 
but uh, we can also uh, find out what is the functional shift as a result of that perturbation. So for a single sample, we create 100 artificial perturbations. Then we simply fit an exponential model, uh, something like f is equal to one over e at tb, where a and b are the two parameters that you can recover. Uh, attenuation is, uh, a is basically the slope of this and buffering is the curviness of this and attenuation A describes the expected rate at which increase in taxonomic perturbation magnitudes are expected to increase functional shift. So if you, if you can recover these attenuation parameters, so higher the value of attenuation, the more stable that function is. So this we have used in an existing study where we are trying to understand how oil uh, gets dispersed uh, using both uh, bio biogenic and synthetic uh, surfactants and by plotting attenuation value over a uh, time scale, uh, higher the value of attenuation means that degradation pathway is becoming more and more robust because there is enough redundancy in uh, microbiome space. So this kind of methodology you can use with both 16S and uh, uh, metagenomics data set, and it offers uh, a really nice way of uh, suggesting how robust your communities is. And then uh, I'm also working on microbial community assembly mechanisms. Uh, I am mainly interested in finding ecological phenomena underpinning microbial community assembly approaches. And the phenomena that we are interested in is to see how stochastic the system is, um, how deterministic uh, the system is, whether there are uh, factors that we have not recorded um, which are responsible for assembling the uh, micro, the uh, microbial communities that you observe. And for that purpose, we use something called a null modeling approach, uh, which is basically whatever data you have recorded or whatever metric uh, you have used, we just simply try to get, uh, we, we, we simply apply norm, uh, uh, randomization, whether it is randomization on abundance table or it is randomization on the phylogenetic tree. Uh, while preserving a certain property of that system, which is typically alpha diversity. And then the deviation of the original metric from the average of the null models after randomization is able to predict ecological processes. Um, for example, NRI and NTI is able to predict whether there is a hand of God or environmental filtering there or whether the assembly is driven simply by uh, competitive, uh, com competitive exclusion processes, i.e. Uh, due to substrate limitation. And uh, there's something called quantitative processing, uh, quantitative process estimate framework, where we are able to discretize these community assembly processes into uh, selection processes and those processes that are driven by drift or homogeneous drift. So I recently published a paper last year where I have uh, used different null modeling approaches. Some from uh, majority of them have been published in last few years where we can uh, get different uh, 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 ecological uh, processes that underpin those microbial community data. So this is a paper that uh, would be of interest to you. Um, and we have used that not only for the, the biosurfactant study, we have used this in, in wastewater and water treatment. Particularly, this paper uh, is where we have tried to understand why in bioreactors, when you have these granules that float, what are the underlying ecological principles. Um, so uh, there are two more topics that I want to cover. So I'll quickly cover them. Um, during COVID-19 times, um, we sort of uh, realized that uh, because students and PDRAs who work on um, these amazing projects, the lab access uh, was limited. So we thought, how about we develop a strategy where we can reanalyze all the data sets that are available online um, and uh, 
convert the, the wet lab projects uh, to simply re-exploration of uh, those data set to provide a global perspective. So we have been working for the past year on uh, meta-analysis um, because there are different data sets on different V regions for Amplicon. Uh, we have focused a lot on how to have a good collation strategy because you do not get overlap between these different regions. Um, but, and not only that, uh, these co uh, collation strategies, uh, we want to recover as much data as possible without read loss. So this paper that we have just published recently, when we uh, collate these different studies together, we realized that we only retain just 3% of the ASVs with uh, which have 86% of the read abundances there. Then in addition to that, when you when we do meta-analysis and we want to put everything together, uh, we can only put things together if we know the taxonomy of the uh, uh, microbes. So in meta-analysis, taxonomic assignment strategy has to be perfect. Traditionally, people use naive Bayesian classifier. In our study, we have changed that to Bayesian common ancestor algorithm, which offers better discretization or better assignment of, uh, of uh, uh, these OTUs or ASVs. And last thing that I want to discuss is <clears throat> that we are working on network inference approaches. Uh, we are constructing network of relationship in these microbial consortia is very important. Um, what we are focusing on is not only finding association or correlation, but also want to find causality there, whether it is in static or it is in dynamic uh, range. Um, and we, are also, we also want to detect sub-communities or want to show mod modularity. Um, in these uh, a network of relationships we, we recover and we are, we are developing a network-wide statistical framework to uh, find uh, keystone nodes and keystone sub-communities. Traditionally, people have used co-occurrence networks where, such as correlation, which is implemented in the microbiome seek that we have developed. And other people are using simple sparse inverse covariance estimation or spike easy software um, to recover uh, relationship. But I, uh, for the past one or two years, uh, have focused on these Boolean networks. And this is made possible by, by this paper that appeared in 2020, which simply takes uh, the abundances between any two species or any three species and it just tries to estimate these different compartments and if you can observe a pattern like this or a pattern like this then you can recover co-presence one way or co-exclusion uh, scenarios and you, we can also recover microbial threesome um, and this is something that I've used in my meta-analysis uh, paper before. And uh, just last two slides, um, we have recently developed a method where we have used non-linear machine learning pattern recognition approaches um, that offer better separation between different samples uh, arising from multiple conditions. So traditionally people use either PC approach or they use uh, MDS approach or NMDS approach. And if you have multiple categories there, the limitation of these approaches is that after you performed reduce order uh, uh, representation, uh, the distances are not that much preserved in reduced space. So our approach considers something called min minimum cur curvy linearity where we can get more separation and if we can get better separation and if we are able to cluster these samples together automatically using Markov uh, clustering, then we that leads to better network inference. And lastly, uh, we have also worked on uh, using uh, antimicrobial peptides to decide which are the species that are going to live and which are the species that are going to die just simply by extracting all the 
antimicrobial peptides uh, for uh, the consortia that you observe and then by clustering them together we obtain the network where the edges between the network uh, represents uh, the species that share a similar antimicrobial peptide uh, and then on this network we have come up with something called a die score which is normalized between minus one and positive one and that gives you the ability to suggest uh, that if you have a community, um, then you can associate a number between minus one to positive one. And so this is a gut community and this positive value means they are more likely to die if they all come together. So this is a new inference approach that we have used. So finally, the conclusions are that understanding microbial communities is somewhat convoluted and hard. And there are several challenges, computational, like uh, Sophie uh, suggested that we need to have a very good HPC facility. And then there are technical challenges, like how uh, efficiently we capture the diversity and at what depth we capture the diversity. And in my group, we are applying methods from machine learning and numerical ecology literature to home down to patterns of interest that may have biological relevance. And we are building devices that harness and exploit microbes and make it easier to understand. And all of these we are using to uh, understand what happens in water and wastewater treatment, um, uh, what happens in terms of pathogenicity um, that is caused by uh, plant associated uh, bacterial pathogens uh, with applications in environment and climate change and then developing diets to improve uh, people health by modulating gut microbiome. So uh, this is basically all that I have to present. I'm sorry I have rushed through everything, but uh, um, they're very, very impressive. <laughs> I, I, I'm involved in so many things that I always get confused. Like. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, like uh, I'll, I'll I'll take questions from the chat box. But if 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 I was going to ask a question, I would ask about your time management, project management. <laughs> it's a lot of work, and um, the outcomes and um, also like the publications are, are quite impressive. And in all the projects, I think you have like deep understanding and uh, uh, application of these um, data anal analytical tools for the. Um, specific areas so very 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 impressive <laughs> and, um, yeah so the first question I'll pick up from the chat box is in general how do you think um, bioinformatics of microbial communities could help inform in-situ applications like enhancing bioremediation or carbon sequ um, sequestration for example so, so basically <laughs> Like, for example, these community assembly approaches, right? Um, you, you can either perform very cleverly designed uh, biological experiments, control experiments, where you can perturb the system. And after perturbing the system, you can measure the changes and you can that can lead to some sort of an interpretation. Or you can take a community uh, which is like nearer to what you observe, then you can use informatics approaches like that uh, um, functional robustness approach that I showed you where you just perturb the community through randomization. And you can also predict like what will happen if this community will change. So really the analytical approaches, particularly null modeling approaches or these perturbation approaches give you the ability to infer functional robustness or infer taxonomic robustness without the need to perform experiments. Yeah, I agree. I think um, also like uh, more understanding of the underlying mechanisms could help us to, to, to design uh, or come up with new hypotheses and then you can um, we can design experiments based on the information we've got from the uh, from these systems yeah, um, yeah. and um, the the second question is 
from uh, Sarah. <laughs> As a non-biologist, uh, what things should the biologist be better at collecting in terms of metadata or experimental design uh, would help with the uh, bioinformatic software development? So, so this is a question put forward by my clinical uh, collaborators all the time. How much data should we, how much additional metadata should we get? Uh, should we be uh, comprehensive or should we just simply focus on a few things? Um, there are methods not right now. I have not mentioned them. For example, I use something called fuzzy set ordination. Um, I use something called RDA with forward selection and backward selection through which if you have like hundreds of additional meta parameters, it is going to filter that down to absolute set of minimum parameters that cause a change in community members or that can cause a change in community structure. So there are approaches right now where uh, we can uh, basically sift through everything. So my general recommendation is get as much that you can get and then leave it to the bioinformaticians to let you know that we can uh, sift through all of these to get the one and we can also rank them if we combine um, uh, classification algorithms like random forest classifier which gives importance uh, measures such as uh, decrease genie uh, dec uh, mean decrease in accuracy we can also now give ranks as well so yes go for everything uh, as much as your budget and time allows Oh, that's a, that's a huge factor. Um, and also James asked about the, the, the cost. Um, what are the pros and cons of building and maintaining your own computational um, facilities? So, I mean, the, 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 there are more cons than pros in, in all honesty. Um, the, my, my problem is I'm an academic, I'm a PI, but I work as a IT technician. Uh, I spend like 20 to 30 hours maintaining that Orion cluster. It is now the biggest, second biggest cluster in University of Glasgow. Um, the other con is that I get a huge amount of traffic from PDRAs, uh, students and all that. Could you please install this? Could you please fix this? Could you please fix that? So the cons are that uh, managing a cluster is very difficult for one person and we are trying our best to now convert it to a facility. Um, the pros is that uh, the, the, the amount of money that you would spend on going for uh, uh, external uh, clouds uh, solution, uh, we can get uh, the same thing, uh, like one fifth of the cost or one eighth of the cost to do the same thing locally. Um, the pros is uh, in my cluster, I do not have any job queues. Um, I have created physical demarcations through several nodes and that makes it easier and that makes the students happy um, that they do not uh, like like if you, they work on uh, cloud computing, they get confused. Oh, I have, do not have enough uh, time and other uh, uh, resources uh, with my own computing cluster. Um, they can just simply go and destroy the cluster. It will only destroy one node um, they, they, uh, and, and, and they can just work effectively. Okay, thank you. And uh, the next question, I think, is about um, the uh, ec uh, ecological models and um, we talk about uh, causality correlation. So this question is um, asking what are your thoughts on possible unimodal relationship that are possibly overlooked by correlation and linear analysis? What uh, alternative methods you would use? There was a paper that came out in 2018 where they used uh, this longitudinal time series data and they uh, discuss that correlations may not be the right way um, because again, because of uh, what uh, th th this guy has written. Um, so um, they have come up with an alternative approach. If you have an experiment where you have uh, fluctuations there, 
um, fluctuations in terms of say you have a system where you have high rainfall, low rainfall, high rainfall, low low rainfall, seasonal data. In that case, this correlation will not work effectively. So in that case, what they are doing is that they are taking the frequency-based approach to find relationship, and they are using something called wavelets um, to find the uh, phases that correspond. So that is one thing. Secondly, um, the, the problem is uh, with reduce order, uh, reduce order representation. So people use PCA, PCOA, and M NMDS and all that. Some of these approaches uh, do not work well. For example, if you, at a very basic level, PCA will not work on your microbiome data unless you apply some sort of uh, normalization, okay? Um, PCA-based approach, uh, they also will not work well if your uh, uh, variability is very low. Then people go to NMDS, which offers better uh, uh, no, uh, sort of di uh, discrimination between samples, but you, you lose the distance between samples in reduced order space. So there's a give and take there. Um, so some methods work effectively. So, uh, to discriminate samples, some methods work effectively to uh, to to conserve the relationship between samples and reduce space. There's no panacea there. You just have to use one method or the other, and then try to see which method works best. Yeah, in terms of the clustering, I think one of my questions is that um, the, yes, there are disadvantages in PCA or MDS. But we, we've seen some machine learning based methods, not in the, <laughs> probably not in the you know, environmental engineering field, but um, in the uh, informatics uh, field. Do you think there, there can be some method that we, we could borrow, adapt for the, the um, machine learning based clustering? So, so if yes. you want to, if you want to adopt machine learning algorithms, or if you want to adopt numeric, uh, sorry, numerical ecology uh, principles, I think the main emphasis should be on how best you normalize the data. All these algorithms are general purpose algorithms which you can apply to any kind of modalities. So the way you normalize the data, which is unbiased, uh, is uh, basically where. Uh, the focus should be. Um, there are different ways to normalize uh, RNA-seq data or Amplicon data. Um, people sometimes use centralized log ratio and uh, relative uh, proportion. Other people use uh, other approaches. So I think in my opinion, the emphasis should be on how best you normalize your data before using any kind of machine learning approaches. The second thing is majority of the algorithms are, uh, are uh, assume that a Euclidean relationship is established. This is all what machine learning and other mathematical algorithms are about. However, because the library sizes differ, you, in, in one sample, you're getting 100,000 reads, in another sample, you're getting 10,000 reads, Euclidean assumption does not hold. So this is the second reason why we should have a better normalization approach so that we can, we, so that we reduce spurious uh, relationships that we recover. Okay, um, thank you. That's very good uh, suggestions. And uh, I'm not sure how much time you will have. We'll have several questions, <laughs> more questions. I have all the time in the world. <laughs> Yeah. So uh, for the audience, if you want to uh, stay longer, you can you can post more questions. And I'll just uh, pick up another question from Claudio. The question is: the the Salmon gut model you showed seems to uh, be a series of batch reactors connected in series. Um, so each one feeds the next in the series. Would the microbial community remain um, segregated in such a system? Um, okay, so first of all, uh, you're asking a computer engineer about what exactly is happening in a system where that primarily a PhD student developed. Um, they, they are connected in sequence. So uh, the communities, I, 
if if i understand correctly they are uh, sort of uh, uh, they are going from one to another like how an int intestine will work and they are inoculated with the actual salmon so yeah it is something like that um if you look up the paper on salmo same and if you can just uh, contact the phd student so they may provide further details on it um i do not uh, really know much about much details in terms of how the uh, systems were set up um but i know uh, from my phd student that it works and it is published so yeah sorry there are a few limitations in yeah maybe you can look for the papers or the the, the um uh, project information to to gather more information um yeah i think that could be our last uh, question and a quick question is the the orion cluster is it available only for uh, users in glasgow or it's open to the public so so this is where the pi and me uh, will say do you want to collaborate with me if you want to collaborate with me then you will have access to my orion cluster or oh, do you have more time to <laughs> manage more projects <laughs> so, so basically uh, i mean we are trying to make it a facility uh, mm. uh, but at the moment uh, the people that i work with whether i work uh, nationally or internationally uh we use orion cluster to perform all the analysis okay so, yeah so if you want to work with this amazing cluster which also has meta wrap uh which can do reassembly uh which can alleviate sophie's concern in terms of uh, not uh, having enough resources then sure let's propose a new project and yeah glad to see that you're open to more <laughs> collaborations i'm always open <laughs> <laughs> okay yeah. um now uh, i think uh, we we don't limit the questions to to your talk only but uh, open the uh, the floor to our audience or questions if if there are any so and uh, sophie is also uh, staying for for a bit longer time um yeah let's see if uh we have more questions. If nobody has any to ask, there were some we didn't ask earlier because of time. Well, we, we've been, I've been trying to address them in the chat, so it might be oh, okay. Okay. Them all. Great. Um, I'm not answering anymore if anyone has any. <laughs> So, so, so some of you may ask the questions on chat, and some of you may may like to uh, contact us. So, feel free to send me an email if uh, there is something unclear, or if you would want me to share my slides, or if you would like to discuss anything that I have been doing. I was so, going to say if if either of you, if both of you are happy to, we can send around your slides to people that have attended. If you would like that, um, oh, we have one more question. Oh, um, could you share your email contacts? Oh, yeah, sure. Oh, sorry, I've sent it to Sophie. <laughs> yeah, and there's earlier message from um, Dr. Sarah Kitting, who worked with you. <laughs> and yeah. she was saying that uh, it's, it may be a bit difficult to understand all the approaches or the, the tools. Um, in, and my question is is uh, related to this because um, I think we have some PhD students in the audience. Like yeah. if they don't have much experience with, yeah. with uh, bioinformatics, um, would, would you suggest them to to um, start? Well, there are many uh, methods in your presentation, yeah. and different approaches and combined approaches integrated approaches so do you have suggestions for um students in their in their uh, phd studies so i th i think uh, what students should do is that in the first instance they should look at a package or a software that is uh, very popular so for example if you'd like to understand community dynamics then i think philoseq uh, is something which is very uh, well documented in terms of tutorial uh, tutorials um, so that would be the uh, starting point and uh, then uh, towards the metagenomics i think metaphilanthropy as a 
reference based approach or tutorials associated with uh, binning like this meta app Ian, we just read about that and uh, that should help you uh, but the advanced techniques that i am using um, well that demands uh, interacting with uh, collaborators or pis who can like guide you um, we, we we regularly run uh, summer schools as well and regularly give lectures as well so and there will be in future uh, some workshops that will come up so some are run by obviously james chong there are some that are run by climb there are some that are run by erlem institute so just simply go and join these workshops and just it's just at the end of the day the more you join these workshops the more you practice the better will be your skill set eventually i would add to that and just say this is really a learn by doing type of skill mm -hmm. and um you know i i got to a point where i wasn't particularly um stimulated by the approaches i was doing so i just went and worked with another group and immersed myself in it for a couple of months and i was i had luxury of doing that but actually in a phd you often have opportunities to to go and work with other people and, and some support to do that so i would just recommend reaching out to people who do these things and seeing if they have any data that you could learn how to use their pipelines with and or failing that you know there are a lot of workflows and um you know resources online that are open access where you can you can work through existing data often they come with sample data and you can just work through it and and gradually once you get the hang of doing things on the command line which might seem really intimidating it's actually quite easy once you've done it a few times and, and it's just learning by doing but on top of that you know the keg path the keg um web server that i mentioned it's very user friendly these web-based ones and there are a few more of those as well and they're very interactive plots so that can be a really nice entry point okay thank you um yeah i think also if people are interested in getting teamed up for kind of bioinformatics training that's, that was like one of the, the bits about this working group is we really wanted to encourage people to get involved in training or to talk about their training. Um, and so I think if you contact Angie and Louise at Evinet, they should be able to put you in touch with me and James or, um, or even I think James's contact details are probably also on the working group. Um, and yeah, we do have um, Evinet so we had an EBNet placement within our lab where we were like doing about how to kind of do 16S sequencing. And I think, I don't know how many are run a year, but I think if you've got some bioinformatic training that you'd like to get, you can pair up with a lab and the EBNet facilitates it. How, how would you go about arranging that from a PI's point of view, if you wanted to facilitate it? Bring um, so I was involved when it had already been allocated, but it's kind of a bit like a small, um, grant application where you put the kind of training and the analysis that you'd like to learn um, yeah. and say how it would help your project um, and then basically I don't know I don't know how competitive in terms of how many placements EBNet offer every year but then the student would have to kind of um, write a report afterwards and submit that report so that EBNet has something um, um, to show that you know to show for the placement um, as Angie said, there is the website does have details on this. Um, I don't know if could Angie or Louise pop the oh Louise has put it in the chat actually. There's a there's a link to the EBNet placement awards. So if anybody's interested, they can um, find out more information on there. Um, I think we should probably end soon because we've ran over for quite a while. So I think some people might have to go, <laughs> but um, I think lo lots of people came and were really interested by the talk. So thank you so much, both of you for talking. I think you both had like quite different, but really interesting talks. Um, and yes, um, the talk will be put up um, on EBNet's um, channel that they have where they put up videos of all the different talks. Um, and there is, I think it's, I've posted it twice, but I think it's been drowned out by like comments each time. But there is a questionnaire if you'd like to fill it out. If either you would like to see a particular thing in this seminar series, um, like if you want it to really focus on different kinds of training, or if 
you want to give a talk yourself and you do bioinformatics and you'd like to kind of present your work we're interested in all kinds of ideas and whether people are um like got a, have got a background like uma where they're like more interested in the computational development side or if you're more like sophie and you're like a biologist that kind of want to do bioinformatics um so i think that's probably everything for today has, have either of you got any last comments that you'd like to make or yeah, so I think uh, this ABNet group is very useful, particularly for uh, PhD students and PDRs. I think uh, not only uh, inviting uh, speakers uh, who have varying experience in terms of bioinformatics is useful, but I think uh, this summer placement for PhD students or um, having workshop uh, or something like small hackathon where students are able to work with PIs uh, with uh, their experience on an example data set, I think that would be very useful to improve the technical competence of the students that are enrolled in uh, different programs. So that is my suggestion. Definitely. If we can get people in a hackathon, that would be quite cool. Yep. <laughs> if you'd be interested as well in a, in a hackathon. So, so all the software that you have seen, uh, they are part of uh, numerous hackathons uh, that we conducted under uh, ES1103 cost action. Um, so Concord actually came out as a result of a hackathon. Seek um, oh. and we came out as a result of a hackathon. So I, I take part in a lot of hackathons. Uh, you, uh, Tira, my PDRA would uh, let you know. <laughs> that almost every other day is a hackathon. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I think we're going to end there for today. Thank you very much to everyone for turning up. Um, and if you have any questions, um, please contact either EVNet or contact um, me or Bing or James. I think our contact details are probably on the registration for the talk. All right. Thank you so much for all the organizers and James Chong. Um, take care all. Yeah, thank, thank you everyone. Thank you. Bye. Okay. Bye. Bye.